collector data is this lovely geological time scale, which is really great for my purposes. Um, so you've heard quite a lot uh, today so far where there's been Professor uh, Lysdale talks about um, lessons that we can learn from history and how you can um, improve fire safety in buildings. And we looked at how models can inform you of how to make buildings and fire safety issues better. So I guess my approach to I won't say fire safety is not quite quite the right phrase, but fire safety um, is using the record of the whole of our history to inform us about um, perhaps how fire might um, impact our key systems and the earth system as a whole in the future. So you'll be aware of the fire triangle and that um, fire is driven by three things. We need an emission source, we need fuel and we need oxygen. And so if you can look at this time scale here, you might say, well, have all these things been around on the earth for all this time? So I'll walk you through the answers and basically it's kind of yes to most of them. So we've always had an ignition source in the form of lightning or volcanic activity. But we haven't always had oxygen on the earth. And the first time that oxygen started to build up in the Earth's atmosphere was around 2.2 billion years ago. So that's way down here. Um, but of course, you can't have a fire if there's nothing to burn. So we had to wait a long time until we had really the first forests, which evolved here around 420 billion years ago. So it's only really from here on up into the present day that fire has been an important natural forcing on the Earth system. So that's just kind of putting maybe a bit of my research into context, but hopefully the rest of my talk will show you how I do that. And as Ricky said, I'm using kind of one fire safety engineering techniques to answer some of these questions. So probably one of the most significant questions that's asked of the Earth sciences at the moment is how will global warming impact on our planet? And of course I thought I'd better first of all present at least some of the evidence Warming. So I've got this plot here, it's work out to understand, so I can point to it. Um, what this plot shows is we've got this is a historical record, so it's not, not on the geological time scale, so from 1880 to around 2005. And on this scale we have um, the temperature anomaly. So if I look at where we've got positive deviations and temperature and negative deviations in the um, temperature anomaly. And you can see that, at least on this plot, from around 1920 you see this increasing positive temperature anomaly, and it's fairly rapid. And in fact, global surface temperatures have increased by around 0.2 degrees, uh, degrees centigrade per decade over the past 30 years. And so global warming is now 0.6 degrees centigrade in the past three decades, and around 0.8 degrees centigrade in the past century. So that's nearly a whole degree rise in global temperatures in just a hundred years. And of course we all know that carbon dioxide is in part believed to be responsible for this. And this just shows some of the evidence of that. So this plot here is the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide measured from one level of observatory on Hawaii. So a very nice place to work on the volcano in Hawaii. And this is the area that it's looking at. So we can see that from 1960 to 2010, um, CO2 has risen from around 320 parts per million to around 380 parts per million. So that's a sort of 60 odd ppm rise in carbon dioxide just in 50 years. And of course, this is maybe supposedly due to being out of course and pandemic forcing. And if we extend this record back to looking at this, we can look back to a thousand years ago. And we know that pretty much until the Industrial Revolution, Atmospheric carbon dioxide naturally seemed to be balanced around 280 parts per million. But as soon as the Industrial Revolution occurred, we started to pump out carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and it's now um, at its current record levels of 380 parts per million. So that's the evidence of these low um, warm carbon dioxide. But of course, we're here to talk about fire. So how does this relate to fire? So models predict that global warming will cause a 44% increase in forest fires annually in the United States, that there will be a 61% increase in forest fires in Canada, and that prolonged fire seasons will occur in boreal, temperate and Mediterranean regions. But of course, why should we care about forest fire activity? And I guess I don't really need to point this out to you guys because of what you 
do the ultimate sailing way. So flying merrily, I guess, is a risk for keeping life. And I've got a few examples here that show some of the destruction that such things occur, um, such things cause. So in Indonesia, in 97 and 98, there were these huge forest fires that were believed to be due to climate change and due to droughts. And there were, these are estimated to the cost of the global economy of $9.3 billion. And that's $1 billion of this due to the adverse health effects of the snow caves. And at the same time, there were huge fires in Latin America that cost around $15 billion. Um, and I think probably most visually, uh, visually impacting and perhaps more in our memories are the huge forest fires that occurred in Australia last year. And these burned 4,500 kilometers square. They destroyed 2,000 dead houses, um, over 3,500 structures, displacing 7,562 people, and killing 173 people and a lot more animals. And these are the images from these Australian fires. And the cost of just the general insurance industry alone, so that is people making claims for their own lobbies for their houses, is currently estimated at 1.5 billion, although this is continually rising now even today. Is still coming in. And all of these fires that I've mentioned here are believed to have been in part driven by global warming, and they highlight our limited understanding of fire in the other system, particularly, and they call into, our, into question our capacity for fire control. Um, and of course, fires also release carbon into <coughs> the atmosphere, and this um, shows the huge plume of smoke from the Borneo fires. And you can see it stretching across Africa, and in fact it covered most of Southeast Asia, and also down into parts of Australia at the time. And the Indonesian fires alone have been have contributed up to 2.8 kilograms of carbon to the atmosphere. And in fact, during this time, wildfires accounted for two thirds of the variability of carbon dioxide profile in the atmosphere. And in fact, wildfires contribute typically around 50% much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere as fossil fuel combustion. So, as I said, this means that forest fires are also a source of carbon dioxide, therefore they're a positive feedback from global warming. So, basically, global warming may impact upon fire activity in two ways. It can influence weather patterns and therefore alter the climate and alter the climate of the continents. And it can also influence vegetation, which is, of course, the fuel available for fires. So this is just the first example of how both warm and warm might influence fire. So this is a model, um, it's a model of drought intensity, um, estimates from 2020 and 2017. Of course, um, the redder it is, the more um, drought the areas are like to uh, see. And you can see that particularly in the UK, a large amount of Europe are expected to see huge increases in drought intensity. Um, in association with global warming. So then we might expect um, huge, uh, much higher fire potential in these areas <coughs> in the future. And we can also look at this um, plot, which is by the IPCC, and this shows the expected vegetation change um, um, in, the, in the future, so 2100 relative to the year 2000, so while we now. But one thing that's really nice about this is that it shows that we'll be gaining forest colours and shrub woodland up the Arctic, and that parts of Europe will be experiencing a change in forest type. So we want to know, you know how they change in drought or changes in fuel and vegetation to affect our fire activity. So we can think about fire on two time scales, and probably what you'll be more familiar about thinking about is um, the modern day time scale for fire. So that is the influence of seasonal variations in vegetation and weather. And there's been a lot of work done on this, particularly by the forestry departments and predicting and um, prevention of forest fires today. And they generally assess the flammability of individual ecosystems over daily or seasonal timescales. But we can also look at this on a long-term multi-million year timescale. And really there's been limited work done in this area. And it's, we do you really need to understand as um, ancient flammability in order to understand perhaps how future ecosystems may respond to climate change. So that of course highlights my interest, which is to kind of ask the question, has, have past global warming events altered vegetation composition? And if so, how has this impacted upon the flammability of our planet? 
So the first question we need to ask really is what we do with this is obviously, have there been any major changes in global temperature throughout that history? So this plot here, um, by David Bin at the University of Sheffield, shows um, global average temperature throughout the past 400 million years of Earth history. So that's from around this point here up to here on this geological time scale in the world. And we plotted kind of what the general average temperature has been since the year 1000, and this is our current change. And you can see that throughout the past 400 million years, Earth's climate has varied quite a lot. So indeed, there's been at times when Earth's uh, temperature was 6 degrees warmer than it is today, that's the global temperature. So it's not unusual that we should see these temperature changes. So if we look to the past 50 odd million years, our current change really is quite unprecedented, particularly the speed at which the change is occurring. So we can come back to this question, have there been major changes in global temperature throughout Earth's history? Yes, in the answer to yes. So bearing that in mind, I'm going to come back to this plot again. And I'm going to use this time in Earth's history, um, the classic Jurassic boundary, which is about 200 million years ago, over here, and which is the age of reptiles, so especially when dinosaurs live. And we are going to look at this period here where we see this rapid rise in global temperature. And this rise here isn't as fast as what we're experiencing today, but it's at least comparable in its sort of magnitude. So it's kind of our, um, <coughs> it's our, it's our past analog for our future, future world. So my question is, did the Triassic Jurassic boundary global warming event cause a change in our forests? So this is what East Greenland looked like 200 million years ago. And I think you'll be all aware what Greenland looks like today. It's either covered in snow or maybe it has tundra type vegetation. But 200 million years ago, the Earth was much warmer. And we had luxuriant kind of tropical rainforest growing in Greenland. But did this change in temperature um, affect the vegetation today at this time? So members of our group uh, back in the city where I was before in Dublin, um, we travelled to East Greenland and we collected over 4,000 plant fossils from Triassic Jurassic boundary age rocks. And here are some of them. As you can see, they look very much like modern leaves today, and they're exquisitely preserved. And I should also point out from the that this is very rare to find such amazingly preserved leaves uh, in the geological world. And, sorry, just And so we took these fossils. And they, are, they come from a cliff section, a bit like this, and they are um, found in different horizons, which we call beds. And so these are basically just the abundance of the, the types of fossils that we found in the beds, just so you can see a broad idea of how many fossils we got from each rock level. And this, this um, curve here shows uh, the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide that has been estimated by the and we can see that throughout our section, so we have a uh, kind of lower carbon dioxide, and then this four-fold rise in atmospheric CO2, which then drop down again. So we can say that these two beds here correspond to this global warming event. So we are interested in looking at did the vegetation in this part is this distinctive from the vegetation in this part. And so um, one of my colleagues, uh, Luke Mander, loved this year we had a paper published and he plotted up um, these map fossils and he, he grouped the numbers of species or the, type, the number and the type of species that occur in these plant, these plant beds. And this is um, a multivariate um, plot. And he found that the, these, these plant beds, so these, these areas, these, these samples, that occurred before the global warming event um, are compositionally different to the plants that occurred during and after. So this is during and then after the global warming event. So we can say that different types of plants grew before, during and after the global warming event. So coming back to this question, did the Triassic Jurassic Band global warming event cause a change in Earth's forest? The answer is yes. So of course, I'm interested in fire. So might these climate-driven changes in vegetation have influenced fire activity? So what drives flammability in northeast systems? So flammable plants in northeast systems are 
characterised by relatively low moisture contents with a fine with fine plant parts with a fuel to air ratio optimised to contain fire. And a good example is oil or forest say in North America. Um, whereas less flammable plants are characterised by high moisture contents and relatively coarse conditions. So oak or beach woodland would be a good example of say for um, Scotland and England. So quick morphological changes in the vegetation across the Triassic Jurassic family and also the ecosystem flammability. So this plot, so I often took um, all the plant fossils and I characterised them into two groupings, one that had broad leaves shown in blue and, and those that had narrow leaves shown in red. And so my broad leaves I considered to have potential low flammability and my narrow or needle-like leaves I considered to have a higher flammability. And you can see that as we went up through the section, the Triassic, so that was time before the global warming that was dominated by broad leaf tree species or plants that had very broad, potentially more flammable leaves. Whereas at and during the global warming event, we saw this increase in these needle-like or narrow leaf forms. So this suggested that there may have been increase in flammability um, associated with the rise in atmospheric CO2 and global temperatures. So, therefore, we might expect to see an increase in fire activity. But does changing plant morphology really influence flammability? In other words, are narrow leaves really more flammable than broad leaves? And this is where the fire safety are coming So, I've tested six um, genera of plants that are morphologically and ecologically similar to the plants that were growing 250 years ago. So, I've got these two narrow leaf forms, so these are all conifers. Two narrow leaf forms, two kind of intermediate forms, and two broad leaf conifers. And we tested these for their flammability in the fire propagation apparatus here at BRE. And um, I think we saw a few pictures of the FPA today already. But here it is. Um, and what the FPA does is that it heats your sample um, using gradient heat. And this um, causes your sample to begin to break down and generate chemical gases. And positioned above um, your sample, there's a small pilot light. So once the flammable, ga flammable gases build up in a sufficient volume, your sample will start to combust. So we conducted approximately equal volumes of plant material and two three samples of each of the types of plant. And we measured um, the time to ignition, um, energy release, and also the amount of the hydrocarbon release rate. And these are the results. Um, so on the bottom scale on all of these graphs, we've got narrow and middle and broad leaves. And so on this plot, we're looking at the time to ignition. And we found that narrow leaves did indeed um, ignite much more rapidly than broad leaves. Um, and when we looked at the average heat of combustion, um, we, we also found that kind of narrow leaves had a higher average heat of combustion than broad leaves. Although this was perhaps not so statistically meaningful in our previous um, correlation. And by combining these two, we can say that, that narrow leaves burn hotter more quickly. And perhaps this is because the narrow leaves seem to have a total um, hydrocarbon, a higher total hydrocarbon structure at the point of ignition. So they were releasing volatiles much more rapidly, which perhaps makes them more flammable. So, this means that potentially the changes in the types of plants, for example, a shift from broad leaf um, flora to a narrowly dominated flora, could influence the ecosystem's vulnerability. But of course, we really want to know were there, were there actually more fires associated with this change in vegetation? We've said that it should become more flammable, but is there any evidence of this? So if I went back to Greenland uh, last year and collected more rock samples, and I looked for fossil charcoal. So this is what fossil charcoal looks like. These are fossil charcoal and these are molten charcoal. And you can see they look pretty much the same. But did I find more? So this plot here shows um, the amount of charcoal that I found through the section. And this is plotted as number of pieces of charcoal per gram of rock. So it's not just sort of random. And we can see that there's actually this five-fold increase in fossil charcoal preserved at the same time as we and we see increased flammability in our ecosystems at the time. <coughs> so it seems that changes in the potential flammability of vegetation 
across this ancient natural globe of warming event, providing a positive feedback on climate potential. And hopefully this highlights the potential of future climate-driven education change to fuel future fire activity.